Nathan. 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 Hello, Nathan. I have a question for you, which I realize is a personal one. Um, but if I may, I'd like to ask you about the ways in which living with young children feeds your creative practice. And this is a question that I think women practitioners often get asked, but it's quite rare to find someone talking about fatherhood as being a kind of force that feeds and nourishes his work. Yeah, so I think for myself, Having children made me reflect about my own childhood and my own parents and my life and open my heart in ways that I think I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, I don't really know that every person needs that experience to open certain things emotionally, but for me, I, I did. It was really life-changing in that way. And I think one of the things as a parent that I feel ever presently is that I'm always somehow failing because no matter what you say or don't say or do or don't do, you always feel like, oh, I could have, I could have done better. I could have said the right thing or been more nurturing or been more firm or been more this or been more that. Uh, and of course, the reality is. Uh, children are their own people who are going to do their own thing and have to grow without you. So it's, it's a beautiful, wonderful journey to be on. I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, and I think also, practically speaking, it made it very challenging <laughs> um, as, as a writer. And strangely enough, I think having the practical, uh, I guess, limitations about what, how much time you have made me want to write more, has made me realize, oh, this is really, really important to me. Natalie, can you talk about a time in your writing life when a crisis turned into a victory? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think um, the, the crisis of feeling absolutely, uh, you know, suffocated and overwhelmed by my day-to-day -day while I was working on Lima Limon, um, I was able to harness that into a book that was really angry and very loud. Um, so I think that I, you know, I am proud of the, on a personal level, of the way that I didn't sort of cower from that anger that I had at that time in my life. Kinesia, if you're going to spend a few days writing, how do you stock your fridge and or pantry? My imaginary pantry would be stocked with mangoes. Um, if mangoes could last for a, a week in my house, they, they don't typically. <laughs> um, and tea. I don't know, you see the thing is, typically, when I'm writing and I'm deep into it, I forget about food until I feel some kind of pain <laughs> that says, you are hungry, get something. But usually there's lots of tea, and I love mangoes. Nathan, what's a current cultural or political conversation that you're sick of, and what would you change it to if you could? That's a very good question, Michael. Okay, okay I, I have one. I think I I'm, am growing sick of the conversation about critical race theory, as I'm sure a lot of people are these days. I think that, like a lot of things, it's become a conversation about something else. It's become a, a touchstone to have conversations about a, a thing that isn't it. And I might even say that I'm sick of the way we talk about race. Uh, politically speaking, or sort of in large social platforms or broadcast platforms. Because uh, I think that these are conversations that are hard to have one-on-one, -on -one, and so people have them sort of by observing others and by sort of like lining up behind um, their particular belief about something. and. I would change it to 
I would change it to not talking at all. If there's something that you believe about race, or for that matter, about any issue that you think is fundamental to human existence that's really important to you, I would, I would almost, I would say, what if you let your actions uh, speak as opposed to making broadcasting statements? I realize that there's reasons why people feel the need to speak out about things that are important to them, and I'm certainly not hating on anybody uh, who is called in that direction. But I would just offer that, that true change comes often beneath the surface through consistent actions that are taken. Dion, what are your thoughts about the relationship between writing and understanding? For example, do you feel the need to articulate to yourself and for yourself what you're trying to say and or do in order to write it? No. I think I begin writing from a question, from a, a conundrum that I need to understand, right? I might have a certain outline, but mostly it's the outline of a question. What is it to be in the world in this way or in this way or in this way? And then as I write, I discover some things myself. So the writing for me doesn't start from what I know. It begins from what I don't know and what I'm trying to figure out. And in the novels, it's, try, it's, it's a character, a person trying to figure something out some difficulty out about the world. And as the writer, I'm halfway there, but not quite. Or at least I tell myself, don't be so sure that you understand this. Be open to something else that might happen as you elucidate this problematic. In a sense, writing through the experience, writing through the questions, I figure out, oh, so that's how that happened. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take it there. There is something at the end of poetry that I absolutely don't know. I cannot get beyond it. Uh, I cannot get beyond a particular line, right? And so the next book begins with that, begins at that, at that space. Then the next book begins with the problem I had with the previous book, right? The, the thing that I was not big enough and not human enough to scale in that book. Yeah. Michael, what are your top three non-musical theater songs that seem like they belong in a musical? My top three non-musical theater songs that I think should belong in a musical are uh, Six Foot One by Liz Fair. Um, I would say Rainy Days and Mondays, Always Gonna Be Down by The Carpenters. And I would say Someday We'll All Be Free by Donny Hathaway. Nathan, what comes to mind with the word border? First thing that comes to mind is the MIA song, Borders. And the chorus of that song is, Borders, what's up with that? What's up with that? And she asks you the question over and over again, just to consider things. My religion is the Baha'i faith, and one of the teachings of that faith is, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. And so I grew up with that teaching and that understanding. And of course, how to enact that in reality is a lot more complicated than the, the, the teaching. Uh, the teaching is something to aspire to. How do you really create a world that it, it acts as one country is certainly a, a huge undertaking. But really, I, th I think that as a writer, as partially what I'm about is 
how do I always hold in my heart the idea that that borders are ultimately choices we make to divide ourselves from ourselves.